So I proposed this almost as a joke um, several months ago, and then somebody, Amy, took me seriously. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit less about things that we are going to do, um, a little bit more about things we should, we should either undo or stop doing. Um, and as you can guess, because you know, I'm a fairly negative kind of guy, it's a long list. <laughs> So, <laughs> so this, this is going to be um, hopefully just the introduction to a more interactive session. I, I, I think um, we might try and do this as a boff. We might try and do it some other way. So I'm not going to try and provide the exhaustive list of, of, of everything that is wrong with Gluster or needs to get fixed about Gluster or improved about Gluster. This is, this is just to provide a, a framework, some examples some starting points um, so that um, people can see what sort of directions, what sort of ideas uh, we're trying to look into. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about code um, because, yeah, that's the kind of guy I am. Uh, I am going to talk some at the end about other things. Um, I'm really going to try and get myself in a lot of trouble when I start talking about some of the organizational issues. Um, because I'm going to say some critical things about uh, about those while my boss is sitting up right over there. Um, so that's going to be great. Um, and the idea is just to shine some light on things that we usually sort of, we've all done it, we're looking at code, don't get them done, you know, that we look away from. I want to actually have us look at it. I want, I want to have, have us look at the things that we would normally want to look away from. So to frame that, I'm going to talk a little bit about technical debt. Now, who here has not heard the term technical debt before? Okay, presentation trick number one. Always ask the question where not raising their hand affirms your point, especially in the afternoon. <laughs> so um, the simplest way to think of technical, technical debt is to focus on the debt part of it. It is time that you are borrowing from the future to use it now, to take to save time now. Like any debt, it does have to be paid back or it's going to get even more expensive. Uh, so usually it's a it's a decent choice. Technical debt doesn't mean somebody just screwed up or did a poor job. Usually, or often anyway, it was an explicit trade-off. They said, I'm under time pressure now, I need to get this thing done now. I know this isn't the cleanest best, most wonderful, most sustainable way to fix a problem, but I'm going to fix it this way now because I need to get this thing done and we're going to pay that debt back later. It's just, just like financial debt. You take it on so you can get something done now and you expect to pay it back later. You intend to pay it back later. And most people do, some people don't. Um, I hope we don't go into technical bankruptcy. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, there's a couple of important points about what technical debt is not. Technical debt is not just bugs, it's not just poor performance, it's not just missing features. Those are usually the consequences of technical debt. They're markers that it exists. They are not the technical debt itself. Similarly, ugly code or a suboptimal algorithm doesn't necessarily mean technical debt. I mean, sometimes it does. Sometimes it means somebody, you know, did a simple linear search when they just really should have done something better. Um, but a lot of times it just means that they implemented what was most expedient for them to implement for meeting current needs. Um, and and the, the challenge is not, not to say, I, in the future, with the benefit of hindsight, am better than whoever wrote this in the past, without that benefit. The, the challenge is to say, how can you structure repaying that debt so that it's a, it's a lower amount, it's costing you less, it's not robbing your project of its velocity. So what, what are the characteristics of debt-written code? One is, it's fragile. It breaks all the time. You have to keep fixing bugs. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Fixing a lot of bugs over and over and again in the same code? Yeah, I thought so. Um, it's particularly in some parts of the code, which I'll be illustrating. Debt-ridden code also tends to be repetitive. Um, that there's a lot of boilerplate or there's a lot of copied and pasted code. 
it's usually easier and quicker to copy something, maybe modify the copy a little bit. I actually have an example based on this idea than to do a serious rethink and refactor of the existing code. Um, it's usually unclear, it's hard to read, hard to debug, and it's inconsistent. This one drives me nuts. I hate this. Because you know, I'm using CSCOPE to try and navigate through the code, and I see an X later T. Okay, jump to the definition of that to see if this field that I'm interested in is present in that. Um, or, or see you know, exactly what type it is because I need it to match some call I'm going to make, etc. Do I need to cast or not? Okay, so I get to a type def. Great. So I have to do the second step and I have to go to the actual structure definition. And it might be any of these forms. It might be the exact same as the type def name. It might have an underscore T. It might have an underscore on the start. It might have an underscore on the end. Now this isn't just, oh, that's so ugly. That's so inelegant. No, it actually cost me time. So I did the calculation. If, if you do something in the code that's inconsistent, that trips people up like that, every 2.4 minutes a day that you cost somebody is a full day of work over the year. Now that's multiplied by the number of developers you have. So when we do these sorts of things, you know, how many days, weeks, possibly months, has this, this silly little thing already cost us? Probably quite a bit. How many people have fallen into this exact same trap of trying to find the definition of a structure through, yeah, I, and even with code navigation tools and I, IDEs, you trip over this. Yes, Michael? One comment here. This is also not the, the serious kind of death. I mean, this is nothing that you would, you would take a lot of time for doing properly in the first uh, approximation. It's just laziness when you do it first. Yeah. Uh, Other things are, are good reasons for it. Prefer, but th this is not... Fixing this is not rocket science. It's a little bit tedious. It might actually be time consuming. Um, but it's certainly not something that requires a big brain to do. Yeah. I hate to dump on interns. We could have an intern do this. <laughs> then they'd hate us forever. They'd probably leave the field. <laughs> so here's, here's the example I was talking about. We've seen this a lot. I've certainly seen this a lot. You've got a piece of code, a function that's calculating something. It's like calculating, you know, which replicas need healing, calculating, you know, any, anything that's going on. And it, it does kind of what you want, but not quite. You need to change it a little bit. Now, you've got people breathing down your neck to fix a bug right now or to add a feature right now. You're, you're up against a deadline. And you think, wow, I could change this function. And so you sort of have three options. Actually, there's actually one I'm going to show here. One is you can seriously think about the function, all of its callers, um, make sure you understand all of the consequences of changing how it works, adjust how all of the callers use it, do all of these things. Um, yeah, that's going to take some time. And, you know, you were on a conference call half an hour ago, you're going to be on another one in two hours. Somebody really wants this fixed now. That's not much of an option. The second option is you can add a parameter where, which says, you know, do it this way versus do it that way. So uh, this one strategic little part of the code, it takes the branch, it does one or the other. How many of us are guilty of that? Yeah. <laughs> I've certainly, see, see the shirt, it says I'm the worst. I mean, I, I do the same crap all the time myself. I'm not holding myself above anyone. Um, the thir third option, which I think is probably the most commonly taken, is is what I call option two here, is you copy the entire function and you modify it to do exactly what you want to need in the current circumstance. It's only called in the one place. You don't need to worry about affecting the existing callers in any way whatsoever. How many are going to leave this one? Yep. And we all do it. It's a common, almost universal programmer shortcut. Um, I actually have a slide about shortcuts too. See? <laughs> forgot what order they were. So I love shortcuts. Shortcuts are fantastic for getting a piece of code out quickly, getting your functionality done, getting your bug fixed, getting your feature working. But you always have to ask this question. If my assumptions are violated and this shortcut turns out to be a little bit too short, then how hard is it going to be to de debug the result? Is it going to blow up in a spectacular and obvious way that it's going to be really clear that this is where the problem was and it's going to be easy to fix. 
Eh, go ahead, knock yourself out, do the shortcut. Um, you know, you'll come back and clean it up later, of course. We all know you will. We trust you. Um, but if it's going to fail in some really, really sneaky way that's not going to go detected, you know, it fails, but it doesn't fail itself. It just like screws up some state so that 10 calls later mm. something else fails and corrupts your data. You just cause somebody a nightmare debugging session. Quite likely yourself. Okay, that's bad. I mean, nobody wants to cause pain for themselves. Quite likely one of your coworkers. That's bad because then they'll cause pain for you. Uh, either way, it's, it's not worth it. If, if, if it's going to be really hard to debug, if it's going to be really non-obvious, if it makes the code more mysterious, that's when you, your alarm bell should go off and you should step back and say, maybe I should take the time to do this in a slightly more elegant way. Okay. Yes? You, you wanted to be interactive, right? Um, so would you mind if I make another comment? Sure. Um, so you do mind, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, uh, you, I mean, these are excellent points. One thing about the, the bug and the, let's say, the shortcut or don't refactor it properly but add a flag or a copy the function is, I think it, it very frequently is the right thing to do first because then you have like a minimal package and backport to a production release. Yep. And, uh, but the point, and that is where the technical debt starts, um, immediately afterwards you should try to do it properly in master so that in future releases, the debugging will be easier and the code will be more clean. But that part is frequently what you Yeah, that's, that's ex exactly true. Uh, these things don't happen because people are stupid, evil, incompetent. They're rational, sometimes very excellent <coughs> choices that people make, but then they haunt you. <laughs> well, it, that's also something that's not only has to be in, inside the heads of the developers, but also the managers. Because yep. uh, uh, the bug fix is not done when the back portable piece of the bug fix is done, but it has to be done properly for the for master plan. Right. So that belongs to the fixing, even if like product and management people don't see it. Yes, the, 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 point, the point that Michael's making, since we have a mic and we're trying to record this, <laughs> is that the bug fixing is not actually done until the proper fix is applied. It might make perfect sense to make the easy, quick fix, um, but you shouldn't consider it done until you've gone back and cleaned up that technical debt. One of the problems that we have, getting into another area of the talk later, is none of our infrastructure supports that that as we go through Garrett to review a patch or something like that, we don't have any way of making that kind of distinction. Um, I don't have an answer for that one, but it's just, just a thought to put into people's heads um, as we have those discussions. Oh, I haven't, I haven't finished this one yet. So let's, let's look at some examples of technical debt now. Okay. Debt code, debt code is usually um, either a marker or it's technical debt itself. We have whole translators, at least one of these I wrote, <laughs> uh, that we've been building for years. Nobody has, a, they've never been in a translator graph since that one time when they were first written. Um, nobody's run them, nobody's tested them, nobody's debugged them, no, probably nobody's looked at them. We should just get rid of them. Um, the reason that they count as technical debt is, is, is that they were often that sort of shortcut. We implemented a translator to do this one thing. It did its one thing, now we should clean it up. Um, we have a whole bunch of modules and functions all over um, that, again, are, are just not used. They served a purpose at one time. But perhaps they were incredibly useful at one time. They're just kind of dead now. Um, yeah, and you can see I actually have examples of things, particularly the, the multiplexing work that I've been doing has given me a, a, a tour of several dark areas of the code that haven't been looked at a lot for, for a while. Um, and these are some things that I, that I tripped over that it's like, oh, I'm making that calculation of should I do the quick fix or should I copy and paste the code? Do I need to account for this use of it? It's like, wait, what use of it? There is no use of it. I can just throw this whole thing away. I don't need to worry about it in my refactor. So again, it's an example of slowing people down. Everybody who look, who's going through that file hits that function and thinks they need to worry about it, and they don't. Um, you know, I've got these defines everywhere that you, know, you have to look and make sure that if you change an enumeration or something that you're not messing people up. And it's like, well, nobody used that one anyway. 
Uh, so, you know, we just kind of need to do a spring cleaning. Dead code is actually one of the easiest kind of debts to pay back. We have repetitive code. Um, so I mentioned a couple of slides back, I didn't verbalize it, but it was on the slide, about adding a FOP taking a lot of effort. Um, you've probably heard me whine about this before. Um, when I added the IPC FOP, um, I ended up changing 500 lines and 20 files, which is rather a lot to add one very simple little thing that does nothing. I, at, at the time, it, it's, it's infrastructure. It didn't actually do anything itself. Um, and I missed a few things. And every time anybody's done something similar, they've missed a few things. I see Pornima nodding over here, because I know you've been through this code recently, too, and you actually fixed one of my bugs. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there, there's this enormous amount of repetition of boilerplate um, that we need to start um, either just getting rid of it in some cases, automating it in other cases, um, using, using various techniques to, to, to avoid the need for it, or just change some of our internal APIs <coughs> in, or, or idioms um, to avoid them. Uh, so the point at the bottom is one of my favorites, is that w there's a whole lot of things that we can use code generation to do in these cases that avoids a lot of this repetition. Um, that you, know, you, you, you can generate code um, for those 30 FOPs that are almost exactly identical except for what they wind to next or what they unwind to next. And if you need to make a change, um, you know, adding the quorum checks in AFR was a good example of this. If we'd had a better infrastructure, you know, we wouldn't had, have had to go through three or four uh, generations of changing each and every one of the, the modifying FOPs um, to do a quorum check. It would have just been automatic. And in fact, I think the current generation does that through a refactoring. But sometimes refactoring is going to be too much work. Code generation is another option you can look at to do the same sort of thing, to just avoid the repetitiveness of the code. Some of the memory management ideas I sent email out uh, about the other day are, are sort of the same thing, that you know, just by changing the way we do things, changing, changing things so that we pre-allocate stack frames and local structures all at once means Dozens of FOPs in dozens of translators don't need to manually manage that at entry and exit every single time. So that's a whole lot of boilerplate that everybody writing a translator currently has to deal with that's bug prone, that can be inconsistent, that can be made perfectly consistent and perfectly verifiable. Inconsistent code. So let's talk about notify. There's a good one. How many people have looked at the notify code? How many people have thought, wow, what a stunning work of art? <laughs> Remember that presentation tip I gave earlier? <laughs> it's working for me. Um, so I actually looked at the list of, of, of what Notify is used for. I knew that we were using it for some pretty different things. The uh, scrub status, I, did, I had no idea that was being going through Notify. I, I, why would it? Um, there were a couple of other ones that really kind of surprised me. So we've overloaded this. Good, decent, good infrastructure. You know, people used it because it was there. They used it because it was expedient to use it, because it solved a problem for them quickly. But now it's become kind of a bit of a mess. So this is where we need to start repaying the debt and figuring out, well, what mechanism should all of these things currently using Notify really be using? Is there a way that Notify should, could work differently that would serve at least some of these <coughs> use cases better? Um, and, and, and we can you know, we, we can start making that more elegant, more clean, more maintainable, more sustainable. Yeah, I know, I'm walking around a lot and screwing up your camera angles. Um, <laughs> so, um, as I say, this has already slowed me down um, when I've worked with uh, JBR and multiplexing. I've, I've, I've run into several things in Notify land uh, when I've been doing the multiplexing. Who else here has, has hit this, who's, who's been trying to do something and they, they've realized they didn't even realize it, but part of doing what they have to do correctly means that you have to go look at the notify path and add some handlers. Anybody? I see Sean raising his hand. Anybody else? Okay, I screwed up. See, I asked an aff affirmative question. <laughs> um, and again, I'm going to keep whining about this until either I fix it or somebody else does. <laughs> yeah. well, one of the points that you said, the word came up, overload the thing. So it has been recently our observation to that. 
many parts in the code, uh, same thing has been overloaded to do many things, and that is a common cause of problems. Yes. There are options in command arguments where the option is used in multiple places to mean different things. And then it becomes very difficult to keep the backward compatibility and still fix the bug. So. Yes, o overloading things, overloading uh, X data is another example of something that we kind of have up ended up overusing. Um, dictionaries in general, to be honest, we kind of overuse those because they're convenient. <coughs> Um, and, and it's perfectly rational to, to do that once. And it's perfectly rational to do it the next time. And it's perfectly rational to do it the next time. It was never rational to do it all ten times. <laughs> it's just sort of a paradox there. RPC layer. Oh, here's another good one. Again, yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, I didn't get that point. Is, is it the event propagation or not the propagation? Is it dependent on the fact that the logic that comes from the event? Okay. The point is more about uh, you know, why not the same is used as such. Like, there is, uh, like, I was at first about depends on notification to be added. So, like, this is not needed to be honest. That is what it's about. So, the, the question is about this point here. Uh, about every translator makes its own rules. Now, part of that is that every type of notify, every, every notify opcode sort of has its own rules. Um, and some of those rules are specific to a certain translator. So, for example, scrub status. I mean, clear, it's pretty obvious that only a few translators are going to care about that. Um, but part of it is the, the, the basic design of notify is that we, um, we put the notify code in each translator. Um, yeah, there's some generic code to invoke the notify entry points, but then what it actually does is up to that translator. And whether it actually propagates it to the next one is up to that translator. So who's the maintainer of the notify subsystem? There isn't one because it's all over every translator. So that's kind of a little bit of a problem right there. But the other problem is that anytime anybody misunderstands what the rules should be for, for their translator to propagate this notify, it, it, it's likely to create a bug, and it's likely to create a bug that violates that guideline I made about shortcuts. It's going to create a bug that's, that's hard to debug, that, that's going to seem really mysterious. Um, some of the worst bugs I find are the ones that happen as, not, as, not as a result of something bad that the code did, it's because of something good that the code failed to do. You failed to propagate this notify, for example. You know, you forgot. There was some edge case in your logic, in your notify routine, that caused that not to get propagated up to the next one. And the next one really needed it. The next one really needed to see that notify to operate correctly. And it never happened. And the, the person writing that translator is then sitting there, why didn't I get my notify? And they have no idea where to look. Nowhere in that entire chain of 20 translators that came before them. It could have been lost anywhere in there. So as an alternative, I'm not seriously proposing this as what we should do. I'm just saying as an alternative, what if notify dispatch was centralized? So that we had one piece of code that made sure everybody got this notify. Now, it has its disadvantages, certainly. It's different from the model we have. That's also you know, a problem. But it, it avoids a class of problems that we have with the current approach. So that's all I'm getting at, is, is, is just that, that we're creating a potential for bugs to creep in that maybe, with, with a different design, we can figure out how to avoid that potential, to make that impossible. So, another comment on that is that if the rules are documented very clearly, then there is a chance of the new translator actually doing what's right. And another thing that's sort of missing in the previous slide. Right. Yeah, if the, if the rules are documented, then that's better. But I, I, I'm going to say that, that <coughs> documenting a complex set of rules is no substitute for simplifying the rules. <laughs> for making things actually impossible. Um, you know, so again, going back to the memory allocation thing, with the pre-allocation, it's actually impossible to have certain kinds of leaks. 
can't happen. So the alternative might be to say, well, here's our detailed life cycle rules for when we need to allocate and free each of these objects. And that's great. I wish we had that. But it's even better if we just say this, this problem cannot occur. Uh, so, yeah, that, it, you know, anything we can do helps, but there's, there are certain things that I think are more powerful in terms of avoiding future bugs. Uh, so, RPC layer, who's looked at it? Who has <laughs> not gagged? Yeah, no hands. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, this RPC layer, um, the callbacks, the states. One of my favorites was that 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 um, <coughs> some of the RPC uh, connect notify connect and disconnect notifies. Now here's where the generic infrastructure has called you. Some of you may have seen this comment in my multiplexing patch. It called you to let you know that uh, that a connection had 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 completed or or that a disconnection had happened. So it knew, but. Your notify has to call it back in with a function saying set connected or set disconnected, or else the state remains unchanged. You know, remember the state that it knew so it could call you? The state remains unchanged, so you're kind of connected, but you're kind of not. And you can use the, you, you know, the connection seems valid, but if you try and use it, then your request hang. I see that team nodding his head back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably made that mistake at least once, too. I know I did. <laughs> Really? Cool. Good. Technical debt paid down. Um, so, you know, examples like that where, where you're, 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 you're almost laying a trap for the next guy. And again, I'm the worst. I've done it too. Um, but, you know, that's the, that's the kind of thing that we need to look at. Um, the fact that RPC is fairly significantly different between ClusterD and everybody else has been, you know, a sort of continuing headache. Um, and the last one is not really debt. It's just something I wanted to throw in there because I had space. Um, is that, you know, we have a very strict, old-fashioned RPC paradigm. Request, reply. No multicast, no pub sub, um, no hints going one way, nothing like that. Um, no flow control. Last talk. So, you know, maybe, maybe we, can, we can do better with look at, taking a good look at the RPC layer and saying, what are our, what are our real needs for an RPC layer? How does this not serve them? What would serve them better? Um, and seeing if we can come up with something that is, is, is probably faster, almost certainly easier to work with, um, fewer bugs, etc. So some other stuff. Um, mempools. They don't seem to be working. Yeah, in, in my work, I actually saw, saw them make performance significantly worse. Yes, Praneet. Why comes down to locking. Our implementation takes a lock on the entire mempool anytime anybody tries to take anything out or put anything back in. If you have a lot of threads in your process, where literally one of my tests for multiplexing, I saw 90% of our CPU time, which was way too much to begin with, 90% of that was being spent in pthread mutex lock. <laughs> and that was being called from the mempool code, which was being called from the dictionary code. So, you know, there are several opportunities there for us to, to, to optimize that problem. Um, state tracking translators, we've had this talk before. We've got <coughs> index marker, change log, change time recorder, FDL, at least one more that I've forgotten. Uh, bit rot. yeah, that's it. Um, so we probably need to think about how can we take all these things that are tracking state and, and, and and not have each of them maintaining its own database where they, they all overlap in what they're tracking. Um, they're all generating extra f-syncs on whatever journals, logs, collections of links, whatever they're using. Um, so we can probably figure out a way to do that better. And again, it's, it's, it's not just that it's going to be faster. That's, that's not technical debt. That's just performance work. But also that it would be simpler, easier to work with, easier to reason about, easier to verify. Um, do we even need our basic data structure libraries of our own, or are there somebody else's that we can use that have been debugged and performance optimized? Um, you know, our, our, our dictionaries 
are pretty much parallel to a dozen other libraries I've seen. Um, and frankly, um, I think a lot of those others are probably going to be better. Uh, besides being somebody else's problem, I think you know, they use nice modern lock-free synchronization techniques, etc. Okay, technical infrastructure. I know I'm running over. So, oh, what? Okay. Um, so, uh, we all know spurious test failures are annoying. We all know they're aggravating. What's a little less obvious is some of the effects they have on broader behavior. Um, yeah, you know, people don't submit patches because they just don't feel like shepherding them through six six rounds of spurious test failures and somebody gives a minus one so they have to change it and then they have to go through spurious test failures three more times and then somebody else who didn't even look at it the first time gives it another minus one and now they have to go through all the test. Sound familiar? How many people get tired of this dance? Yeah, okay. Any Anybody not tired of this dance who is also not a Red Hat full-time developer? <laughs> I think pretty much everybody who fits that category just raised their hands. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, th that's a problem. Um, people resist changes because they don't want to run it through another, round, another gauntlet. Um, they abandon patches. I've done this many, many times. You should look at my abandoned patch list sometimes. It's great. Um, people get annoyed at each other. They get pissed at each other. I, I, I know, I, I, I've been told that there's one person on the team who will not work with me because I gave them a negative review on a patch. Well, yeah, that's partly because I'm a jerk. <laughs> no question about that. It's, it's also magnified by, by this, th this difficulty that it creates whenever there's a disagreement. That we, we have a system that instead of attenuating the negative consequences of disagreeing about how something should be done. It magnifies them. Um, and that's really just not a good thing. Now the thing that's totally invisible is the patches nobody ever sends. Nobody ever thought of sending. Because they looked at how all this goes. They can see it. It's all out there in public. Um, and they said, wow, don't want to do this. So they're not even in the room. Of course they're not. They could have been, but they're not. Um, and another controversial one, because you know, I haven't annoyed enough people yet. Tendency to put form ahead of content. We tend to enforce the rules that are easy to enforce, that are clear, not the rules that are most important. I've seen a lot of things get, get through Garrett. There was lots of argument about formats, names, adherence to sort of superficial things. Meanwhile, Eventually those all got resolved and the patch went through. Meanwhile, there was a serious logic bug in that patch that nobody ever looked at. And it came back to bite us and became an actual bug affecting an actual user down the road. Okay, now why is it that we were, were spending so much time looking at the superficial stuff and nobody actually looked at the logic? Well, I mean, as I said, people like to look at the stuff that's easy to enforce, that's clear, that's easy to define. But we need to think about... Um, you know, whether this is actually helping us down the road produce more bug-free code. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting excited. <laughs> and it gets better. So our release planning. Anybody think we have a nice, organized, structured, smoothly running release infrastructure? <laughs> Glad to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the craziest person in the room. Um, so we're using a lot of different tools. Some of them are pretty painful. Um, within each tool, I, I, how many Etherpads do we have for all this stuff, really? It's quite a few. Um, how many Google Docs? You know, it, it, um, our entire process is, is, is pretty complicated. And we all know this. We've all talked about it. Um, and the funny thing is, each time we talk about it, it gets more complicated. Um, so, um, you know, we probably need to think about how we can actually turn this into, into a repeatable, scientific, and hopefully simpler process. And that's kind of my segue for Nigel, by the way. Um, and the one that's really going to get me in trouble. Um, no help from downstream. You just leave, good. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not saying this to make the point that Red Hat is evil. 
uh, Red Hat being the primary sponsor of this. I know we're not the only people who develop it, but you know, we, we employ a lot of the people here. Um, this is a fundamental problem with an upstream downstream kind of model, uh, that these kind of conflicts occur. So, you know, it has never, from that side, made sense to dedicate a release or a full-time, professionally trained release or project manager to a project. Yes? Plus one on this, we all have seen how much it has helped to get Nigel on the infra side. I think we'll have the same result if we have something for release. So. I think Nigel might have something to say about that. <laughs> 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 yes, definitely. Getting getting dedicated experts to work on these things, which do require dedicated expertise and time and focus, um, is, is amazingly powerful. Um, so, again, not bashing my employer, that would be dumb, um, but they tend to inject random requirements, reassign resources, etc., all the time. I mean, they have their own imperatives separate from upstream. So, so the point is not they bad. The point is we cannot and should not rely on our downstream to provide that support. That you know, We as an upstream community have to grow that organically within the upstream project. Um, and you're always supposed to have a call to action at the end, so you know, I do, and it's in big red letters. Um, yeah, stop slowing ourselves down. I, and I'm not just saying this because it annoys me personally. Well, okay, partly. Um, you know, I'm saying it because you know, I, I've been asked many times by people peripheral to the project, how the heck can you have so many people working on Gluster and get so little done? That's not me speaking. I am quoting like a dozen other people who have come up to me at Red Hat Summit or other people within, you know, within other organizations, other companies. They say, you know, it just doesn't seem to be moving very fast, does it? Um, and part of the reason is that we're doing these things that just slow, ourself, slow us down unnecessarily. We have fundamentally hard problems to solve already. Distributed file systems are not ever going to be easy. So we do not need to add to the difficulty with all sorts of other things like technical debt or infrastructure or organizational problems or anything that isn't you know, pushing us faster. You know, we have a lot of things holding us back. We need to have some things that help us move forward. Um, so that's basically you know, what, I, what I want people to think about is what slows you down and maybe in a buff today, tomorrow, whatever, maybe in the hallway, maybe in an email, whatever. You know, let's talk about what these things are and how we can actually speed up our development. That's it. So it seems like the questions for this are going to turn into a buff. Pretty much. Pretty much. So my thinking at this point is I'm worried that the coffee is going to go away if we don't get there. It happens sometimes. So I propose 10-minute break, coffee, come back. We'll finish up with our release.